Hello, good people of YouTube, Mountbatten here, and today we're taking a look at the 2001 World War II drama Pearl Harbor. Now, Pearl Harbor is a movie that I haven't seen in quite some time, and as I asked you guys last week, it's a movie I was looking at doing a new movie review on. I've done two of these in the past, one for Greyhound, which unfortunately Apple TV apparently didn't like and they took it down, and another one for Midway, which, while not taken down, did get demonetized, so we're having another shot here with Pearl Harbor. Now, the reason it got delayed from being last Sunday's video to this Sunday's video is because, good lord, this is a long movie. It comes in at just over three hours and three minutes, which is ironically over twice the length of the actual attack on Pearl Harbor. And yeah, there's quite a bit to talk about with this film. So it was released in 2001. It stars Ben Affleck as Rafe McCauley and Josh Harnett as Danny Walker, alongside Kate Beckinsale as Evelyn Johnson. And there's quite a few other characters throughout this movie. But you guys aren't too interested in that, as were the critics back in the day. You guys probably want to hear more about the historical aspects of the film and its inaccuracies, and trust me, there's a lot here. So let's go ahead and dive on into Pearl Harbor. The film starts off in 1923 in Tennessee with a young Rafe and Danny playing in an old biplane. Now, this here pretty much sets the tone for the movie in terms of historical accuracy. So the year is 1923, and crop dusting really hasn't gotten fully started just yet in the way that we're seeing in this scene. There's not these small independent crop dusters out just yet. Actually, Delta's precursor is the only one doing commercial crop dusting in 1923, and they certainly aren't using planes like is shown here. Even the wreckage that the kids are playing on is far too new. These should be surplus World War One biplanes. The plane that's being flown here, the red one, I don't think that was even produced until the 1930s, late 30s at that. But anyway, so that out the way, uh, basically what we see here is that Danny and Rafe want to be pilots, yada, yada, yada. But anyway, after that, we see a montage of what's going on the way. Is that a U.S. tank in France in 1940? Uh, yeah. Of what's going on in the war at the moment. And of course, Hitler's invaded France and it's going quite well for him at the moment. While Japan has begun their conquest of China and the U.S. continues to be the U.S. and stay neutral. It wasn't always that we were getting involved in places around the world at the drop of a hat. So flash forward, Danny and Rafe are now enlisted in the U.S. Army Air Force and are undergoing training as lieutenants. And what we see here is actually for this movie pretty accurate. The P-40s are actual P-40s. However, they are much later variants such as the K, M, and Ns and not the B and Cs that would be in use and in production at the time. Not that big of a deal considering these, from what I can see at least, are actual P-40s and that's always good. So Danny and Rafe do some, well, Michael Baying as this movie was directed by Michael Bay and eventually get drug into Doolittle's office. Hey, it's Alec Baldwin. Are we sure all the weapons on set are empty? So Doolittle, 1940, was not overseeing the training of new pilots at this time. He was overseeing the conversion of auto plants into aircraft production plants. Uh, why is he here this early in the film in the wrong place? Because we have to, I don't know, pay Alec Baldwin to be here and you want to get your most out of Alec Baldwin at this time. It's the early 2000s. He's still a pretty uh, well-known actor this time for the proper reasons. Uh, by the way, we're 20 minutes into the movie. There's no, uh, no IJN, so, yeah. So the rumor is the Navy's shipping us to Pearl Harbor. Well, wouldn't be so bad. It's about as far from the fighting as you can get. You got a suntan. So maybe the army will post you guys there, too. So what was said just there is pretty much the general thought about being stationed at Pearl Harbor that most enlisted had. They saw it as a vacation, not really a risky assignment. It's in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. You have all these beaches, nice weather year-round, and you're pretty much away from everyone, so you're pretty much untouchable at the moment. Hey, that's the Queen Mary, and she might be in New York at this time? Um, her, Normandy, and Queen Elizabeth sat idled in New York at the outbreak of the war until May of 1940. Then they were used as troop ships. So if this is taking place before, I think, mid-May of 1940, this is actually accurate. But the Eagle Squadron Batman's going to join. Well, that he was 
voluntold by Doolittle to go join, wasn't formed until September of 1940, at which point the Queen Mary would not be chilling in New York. She would have undergone her wartime uh, refit. She even had, like, degaussing lines fitted to her, along with several other changes. Of course, a brand new paint job as well, uh, as a troop ship rather than being sitting in new york harbor just chilling there so yeah so either queen mary shouldn't be there or the eagle squadron shouldn't exist just yet ah yes his royal majesty franklin delano roosevelt played by john voigt and i feel like he does a pretty good job of portraying fdr and he gives some pretty powerful performances in this movie and in my opinion he's one of the highlights of the movie oh look we're 33 minutes in finally the japanese navy is showing up Yep, for the Japanese invasion of China and slaughtering of the Chinese people, oil was cut off from Japan, and the U.S. supplied around 80% of Japan's oil. Japan did not produce nearly enough oil to feed its war machine. Thus, they had to take action if they wanted to maintain and grow their empire, and the United States was very much well aware of this. The whole point of us cutting off Japan's oil was so they could not pursue these imperial ambitions, and we had a very good idea that it would anger them if we did so. Yamamoto was inspired by kites 34 minutes in we're finally at pearl harbor oh look it's an iowa with missiles yeah so this is actually i'm not sure exactly where they filmed this if they filmed this in pearl harbor then this is the missouri for sure um if not and they filmed it at the mothball fleet this could be the wisconsin or the new jersey so yeah uh -huh. they didn't bother cleaning up the fact that she has missiles on her. I'm surprised they even covered up the Sea Whiz. I think the Navy actually took the Sea Whiz off of uh, the Iowas, I think, when they mothballed them. So anyway, yeah, that, that's an Iowa. That, that ship is still being constructed at this time. Uh, their kills are laid down in 1940, and I believe we're in early 1941 at this point in the show. So she's still, I believe, a well over a, a year away from being uh, launched if she is the Iowa. If it's the, of course, you know, the later ships, then we're pretty far away from them being launched as well. Oh yeah, speaking of time traveling Iowa class, look, she still has her World War II victory ribbon and all her other ribbons from the much later conflicts they participated in. A lot of people frown on the Yanks for not being in this war yet. I'd just like to say, if there are many more back home like you, God help anyone who goes to war with America. Uh, well, you did. Twice. Oh, look, it's another Iowa, accompanied by clear 70s and 80s radios and radar masts in the background. I'm assuming these risk assessments include Hawaii. Well, Pearl Harbor is too shallow for an aerial torpedo attack, and we're surrounded by subnets. All we have to worry about here is sabotage. That's true. Oh, look at that in the background. There's a beautiful-looking CGI Imperial Japanese Navy fleet. We'll come back to this. <laughs> Yep, that's true as well. The harbor in Pearl Harbor was, I believe, around 40 feet deep. So the traditional torpedoes at the time, aerial drop torpedoes, they would drop down to around 120 feet below the surface before coming back up to the surface and being at a depth at which they could strike a ship. So the Japanese came up with this chalk that you put on the back of the propeller that forces the torpedo up at a much, much, much shallower depth than the traditional depth. And it, well, worked, as we all know. There sure is a lot of the Battle of Britain in a movie called Pearl Harbor. Hey, that's literally the Whipple. That is a Knox-class frigate commissioned in 1970 with another Knox behind it and again in Iowa. I, I'm not sure if this is supposed to be portraying the Oklahoma or the Arizona at the time? Oh, look, he's got a Hawaiian Mark $5 bill. That wasn't used until after the attack. So these $5 bills with the Hawaii overprint on them, or, well, there's bills in general with the overprint on them. Uh, the idea is that if the islands fell into the hands of the Japanese, the treasury could just go, okay, all $5 overprint bills are now worthless, and therefore the Japanese couldn't use that as legit currency. Obviously, before the attack, they would have no reason to even do this, but 
movie is movie. Now, Cuba Gooding Jr. here is portraying Doris Miller, a cook on the Oklahoma that performed a very heroic act uh, later, as we'll see in the attack on Pearl Harbor. And the movie seems to kind of dance around talking about what it's like for African Americans in the 40s in the U.S. military when it's still largely segregated. Um, they waste a lot of opportunities here to shed a light on that situation telling it as is and showing what he went through and still what he did despite facing all that discrimination and hate so they really dropped the ball with doris miller here in my opinion oh yeah the japanese are in this movie we're 50 minutes in by the way this is i believe the third time the japanese have shown up oh uh Bat batman died by the way apparently whole carrier divisions can just disappear excuse me we have four what I believe is supposed to be Imperial Japanese Nimitz-class carriers, four Imperial Japanese Arleigh Burke guided missile destroyers, two Imperial Japanese guided cruisers, the Ticonderogas, four Imperial Japanese Oliver Hazard Perrys, and one Imperial Japanese Los Angeles nuclear submarine? Okay, this is where I'm going to talk about this movie's decisions with regarding special effects. So... It's 2001, okay? And seven years before this, we had Jurassic Park, which showed you can use CGI to great effect in filmmaking and have lifelike looking things. And of course, even before that, we had Terminator 2 showing the liquid effects. Even before that, we had The Abyss, which also showed the liquid uh, visual effects of CGI. And CGI has come a long way since it was first being used at this point in history. And, and this is a movie with an, um, a massive budget. At the time, it had a $140 million budget in 2001. In today's money, this would be a budget of $228 million. That, that's, that's a pretty big budget. So, despite having an absolutely massive budget, they seem to use stock footage of, from what I can tell, at least rim pack training exercises, which is those big Pacific exercises where you have uh, the United States and all the Pacific powers get together and do these big naval uh, war games and training exercises and such to portray the Japanese fleet and later in the movie the, the American fleet. And it's very clear to anyone that's even the slightest military buff or history buff that... These ships are way, 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 way too modern to be even thought of. Like <laughs> this is early World War One. Um, the idea of the nuclear reactor is mostly theoretical at this time, and of course, as we all know, uh, nuclear power and energy didn't really become widespread until the end of World War Two, and they're on out. And it's not like they're using ships that are like ten years off, like a movie like Tor 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 did which was also made in the 50s before CGI was even a thing. They used a combination of models and mostly practical effects or very large-scale mock-ups. I mean, I believe they built literally a Fuso, or I think the Nagato, for that movie. But here, Michael Bay seems to be pretty apt to just use rim pack footage, which I find very strange considering this movie's budget. Now, I believe it was him or Jerry Bruckheimer that said that they didn't want to rely too much on CGI. They wanted everything to be practical, that they could do practical, and only did CGI when either it was a shot that really needed it or something that's too dangerous for uh, a stuntman or a stunt pilot to do, which you do see. And even throwing it back to the Battle of Britain scenes, that's CGI, and it still looks good today. I mean, it's well-made CGI, and it looks good. There's some very cool shots, and the planes are accurate, and, of course, the fights aren't entirely accurate, but it looks good. It's the right stuff. So, why, then, in so many shots, are you using Rimpack footage and just U.S. Navy stock footage for shots that you clearly have the models for? We, we literally saw the IJN fleet in the background earlier, which had the uh, carriers that would strike Pearl Harbor. And I, you know, we, we, I think we even saw some Mayokos in the background too earlier. But then for these close-up shots, when you're looking at it, it's all wrong. But I just wanted to rant on that for a moment. I mean, but there's just no excuse for this when, yes, I understand that there's not a lot of IJN ships left floating around. In fact, there's none. But come on, you can't have the, a Nimitz class, you know, four acres of floating steel portray the Kaga. <laughs> it's, 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 it, they look nothing alike. But some of the stuff later is really wonky, and we'll get to that here in a, in a minute. Be careful, all right? Ladies, cloud the mind. 
You know, General Zod is spitting facts here. You haven't talked about the love triangle much because I don't care. You don't care, nor did the critics care. Oh, look, they CGI'd the Nimitz out, but left in all the other modern USN ships. What? Why? Why? And, and look at that. Like, the, the carriers look good. They're accurate. It's, you know, he gets the Kaga, the Akagi, and so forth and so on. But we left in the other ships? It, which, by the way, you know, they absolutely just plastered the IJN carriers over the, the Nimitzes that would be in this formation. So naturally, these carriers are way too large. But if you just would have done the rest of the ships properly, this would have looked great. Oh, look, Batman's alive. It was December 8th for the Japanese, but I think what happened here is that for the American audiences, they had the Japanese flip the calendar from the 6th to the 7th, and then for the international audiences, I think it was uh, from the 7th to the 8th. Why are they doing a kamikaze ceremony? Kamikaze attacks weren't until much later in the war when the Japanese were getting desperate. And what you see these guys doing here, putting on the uh, the headband and uh, bowing and drinking the sake, this is a kamikaze ceremony that you would do before you would go on a kamikaze attack because it's considered a very honorable thing to do to give your life in defense of the of the emperor and of, of, of Japan. Uh, they wouldn't do this. They weren't going after the U.S. Navy with kamikaze attacks. They were going after them with normal air attacks, so this wouldn't be happening. I mean, it looks cool. It's wrong. Looks the CGI Japanese fleet again. Why not reuse it? You have the models. I don't get this. He has the models. Well, the Michael Bay is who I'm talking about here. You, you have the, mo the, the models, Michael Bay. You have the CGI models. Why not use them? Oh, look, it's the Imperial Japanese Lexington again, and you're taking off from the start. What? What? Why? And what's really funny is before you saw them taking off, if they clearly were taking off from the bow of the carrier because you can see the catapults there at the end, but why are you taking off from the stern? That doesn't make any sense. I, I guess it kind of looks more like the uh, Japanese carriers because the, the the bow and the flight deck didn't come of and meet like the American carriers did. You know, the, and the, the uh, Lexington has that kind of uh, overhang of the flight deck at the end where you have the stern. I've been to the Lexington. This is Lexington CV-16 in Corpus Christi, Texas, by the way. Um, so I guess if you're looking at it from like the the water, you could see that you know it ha kind of has that overhang of the uh, flight deck there. So maybe, but then why'd you show them taking off from the front and the shot before this? I don't, I I don't know, guys. It's that this movie doesn't make a lot of sense to me. But yeah, <sighs> more ships from the 70s and 80s. Oh look. Correct CGI ships. Why weren't you doing this earlier? This is literally the Texas now. Um, now the Texas was on the other side of the planet away from Pearl Harbor. Like all of the New York class BBs, none of them were present in Pearl Harbor for the attack. But she's at least period accurate for once. Now this also causes me to think, why don't you use her for all those other shots when you had those shots of the deck of the uh, Missouri or Iowa or Wisconsin, whatever Iowa class that was, why didn't you use the Texas? I mean, the Texas has plenty of places that you can dress up or get different camera angles of to make it look like that, you know, it's a different ship and she's, you know, more of that World War One or pre-World War One era super dreadnought style battleship with the correct looking superstructure and general aesthetics that also, you know, the ships like the Arizona and Oklahoma had and the Pennsylvania class had. Why not reuse that? It's, give me $140 million. I can make a much better movie than this. Oh my God. Uh, the Japanese didn't intentionally target civilians. The main goal of the attack was to knock out the uh, U.S. Navy ships sitting in harbor. You didn't want to waste any munitions attacking civilians because that would do nothing but make America even angrier. So why waste time and fuel and munitions doing that? That's how that happened, uh, at least one of the theories about how the Arizona was destroyed. An AP bomb, which is actually a modified 406mm shell, was dropped on the deck of the uh, Arizona by a high-level bomber, and it pierced either into the 
I believe they think it was one of the magazines for the one of the secondary guns or one of the black powder magazines that they had. Now, the black powder was used to ignite the smokeless powder that was then used to, of course, project the massive 14 inch shell of the one of the Arizona's guns. And the black powder had to be stored in a separate area because black powder is a lot less stable than smokeless powder. Smokeless powder is actually very hard to get to uh, detonate or go off without something like a black powder charge going off first so we don't really know exactly what happened to the arizona because as you see in this absolutely beautiful animation this is wonderful by the way um there's not a lot left as you can see that bomb went off and it set off the magazine and it absolutely blew out the sides of the bow of the ship and then the ship quickly sank thereafter so there's not a whole lot left to go off of on the arizona today but it's absolutely a beautiful animation and definitely a highlight of the film and here we have it, a moment that I actually was wish was in Midway. Um, Doris Miller gets up, mans an AA gun, a piece of weaponry he's not trained for, and starts to lay down fire on the Japanese planes attacking Pearl Harbor. Uh, again, if his story had shown the hardships and discrimination he faced while serving in the U.S. military in the 1940s, this would have a much more profound effect. Now, don't get me wrong, it is a very powerful moment, but so much of it's taken out because they didn't do his character justice. And this is a really, really sweet practical set. They built this. Th this whole bow and the front two turrets, and I think even the superstructure in the background, this is all one giant uh, gimbal of the Oklahoma's bow that they could raise up out of the water, twist, and capsize, and put back down in the water. This looks amazing. Looks great. And this right here is a really effective shot, too. Interior shots of the Oklahoma as she's capsized and sinking. This is probably up there with some of the, the most horrifying moments I've seen on film, thinking about being those guys that were stuck inside as the ship capsized and went down. Earl and his mofo trench gun ready to take on all of the IJN. This is a stupid scene, but God, I love it. Now, the following sequence when Danny and Wraith hop into their P-40s, get up in the air, and take the fight to the Japanese might seem as more nonsense from this movie from Michael Bay, but this actually happened. Now, not exactly as it's carried out. Of course, there's a lot of Hollywoodisms in the fighting that took place between uh, Danny and Wraith and their P-40s against the Japanese and their Zeros and uh, other aircraft. But several American pilots did get up into the air during the attack on Pearl Harbor. And Danny and Wraith's little escapades here are based upon Lieutenant George Welch and Lieutenant Kenneth Taylor, both who were coming back from a Christmas party and an all-night poker game. They had received somewhere along the lines of three hours of sleep. Once the attack kicked off, they raced their way to the airfield, where, just like we see in the movie, they were attacked by the Japanese in their car, got to the airfield, hopped into a couple of P-40s, still wearing their tuxedo uh, shirt and pants, took off and got into the fight. So again, kind of based on historical fact, but uh, stretched quite a bit here in the movie. So right here, Yamamoto cancels the third attack wave, and there's a couple of theories as to why. Um, one, the leading theory is that, of course, the carriers aren't here, so where the hell are the carriers? And, you know, you're literally wiping out an entire fleet using your carriers, so where the hell is the American carriers at? Are they positioning to attack? They know that you were, that you were going to attack them, and they're about to launch your own attack wave, and Yamamoto knows that the Japanese cannot afford to lose these carriers, so let's go ahead and get out of here. We've done what we've came to do. The U.S. Navy is absolutely crippled. We've done it. Let's leave before we suffer any more losses, and they had faced very light losses up until this point, and plus, two, the Americans know that you're here now, so they're going to be more prepared. They're going to have more anti-aircraft weaponry uh, ready and ready to go. Any fighters that you missed are definitely going to be up patrolling the skies when you come back for the third time. So again, let's cut our losses. We did what we came here to do. Let's leave. Now, we're not exactly sure if this is what Yamamoto said, but it was most definitely what he felt. We know this from his journal entries and such. John Voigt as FDR gives a very nice rendition of the Day of Infamy speech here. And you might think, okay, the movie's over now. Pearl Harbor is attacked. We've seen what's happened. But no, 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 no. Of course, they have to do the Doolittle Raid. 
and a lot of the inconsistencies, well not inconsistencies, but historical inaccuracies continue here. And now we're back on, well, before we even get there, um, a lot of what they show about the Doolittle Raid is how it happened. Of course, the B-25 was selected, it was lightened as much as it could, made into a flying gasoline to where the B-25s could reach the Japanese mainland, and the idea was we want to do this morale-boosting attack on Japan. It won't be anything majorly effective, but for morale, something the country definitely needed, and that is definitely true. How they go about doing it in the movie is, again, mostly accurate, except uh, Rafe here and uh, Batman, or Batman and Danny, whoever. I, I don't care, you don't care, no one cares. Uh, they, of course, weren't actual do little raiders they aren't they they're fake characters they, they have no historical basis whatsoever so rather than maybe following two of the actual raiders they just stick batman and danny into a b25 and, and go on about it and okay movie oh and alec baldwin's back factually yeah the raid happened and a lot of it went down the way it happened the fleet was spotted early raid happens um Danny doesn't make it out. Batman goes back, marries Kate Beckinsale, and Danny's kid that he had with her is named Danny, and Batman's like, you want to fly? And they're like, yeah, and they go fly off in his dad's biplane from the beginning of the movie. That's Pearl Harbor! Um, a lot of the historical bits of it, again, a lot of what's told in the movie is fairly accurate. If you want to, like, you know, dissect that stuff that's that that's mostly how it happened but a lot was shown on screen the equipment the japanese attacking civilians uh danny and rafe going on the doolittle raid of course didn't happen so it, it's one of those weird cases where someone did their research and how the attack happened why the attack happened and the motivations behind a lot of the decisions made in the movie but it's not portrayed very well I'm not sure if they didn't have a military advisor on set or they didn't have a historian on set or Michael Bay just didn't listen to him. Um, but a lot of this could have been avoided. This could have been made into a pretty darn good movie, even with the three hour runtime and like, I think an hour and 59 minutes of this movie not having anything to do with Pearl Harbor or even the Doolittle Raid. It still could have been a pretty good movie with the budget and such, especially if some of that budget was uh, focused on, of course, getting the right shots, getting the right CGI models and such. Um, and again, to the attitude of, especially today too, you hear this a lot, you know, we need more practical effects in movies and such. Sure, that's true. CGI has become a bit of a crutch recently in movie making, but in cases like war movies, World War II, when you don't have Japanese ships sh ships laying around anymore, you don't have a lot of pre-World War One or uh, pre-World War II ships laying around anymore to film scenes like the Pearl Harbor scene, go ahead and use CGI. It's, it, it looks right, it's accurate and such, and you'll get a better movie out of it, and hardcore history buffs will appreciate it more than you know, an attempt was made, at least, to get the proper stuff, which is why I didn't make a big deal about the P-40s earlier, because yeah, they're not P-40Bs and Cs, but they are K, M, and Ns, which is fine. It's fine, especially, again, because there's not a lot of P-40s left, and a real P-40K is better than a CGI P-40B, in my opinion at least. But a real Nimitz-class aircraft carrier is not better than a CGI Kaga for movies. It, it's... It, yeah, yeah. So, because of that, and because of the abhorrent long runtime of this film, and the, again, completely senseless and useless love triangle thing i'd give this movie like a three out of ten i know before i said i'd give it a one because it's terrible but again going back on it looking at a lot of the you know the facts behind the attack and the dates and such they are all correct for the most part but what's portrayed on screen the inaccurate ships and such it absolutely takes you out of it if you know what you're looking at which again even a mild military buff can tell that that's a nimitz carrier not uh, the kaga so, yeah, it's a solid 3 out of 10. I think it's free to watch on Prime if you guys want to torture yourself with it. Um, I did for this video, so please drop a like and subscribe to the channel. And tell me what movie would you like me to take a look at next. I know a lot of you have said Tora Tora Tora. It might be the next one that we do if this video even stays up. Please, Michael Bay, I know I said a lot of mean things about your movie, but um, 
you make a lot of money. I don't. Please be nice. Anyway, guys, hope you guys enjoyed. Hope to catch you guys in the next one.